taken about the people and places I've been blessed to encounter. Many of the people here in this room tonight have played a role in my standing before you now as the 174th president of the Iowa Medical Society. This is an honor, a privilege I do not take lightly. Much of who I am is shaped by two people who are not here with us tonight. I am a third generation last year at the position. My grandfather was the son of Polish immigrants born in New York. He graduated medical school in Chicago during World War II. In his training, he started to practice in rural Michigan, recruited by a local factory. He had completed a surgical residency, but had limitations in his scope of practice as a DO for a number of years. So much was different about the practice of medicine during those times, beyond the difference in our understanding of disease and treatment options. The cost of medicine, medical school tuition was a mere $500 per year. Less than 10% of Americans had private health insurance as we know it in the early 1940s. Many of my grandfather's patients paid for their care by like bartering. His patient, his practice encompassed what we now think of as full scope family medicine with surgical privileges. His profession defined him. Everyone called him back, including my grandmother. To me, he was Grandpa Doc. His Norman Rockwell existence was most vividly portrayed at his retirement party. After nearly 50 years of practice, people traveled over 100 miles to visit him, thank him, and share stories of the generations of their family touched by him. I was in middle school at the time, deep in the throes of self-centered adolescence. <laughs> and even I was awestruck by the impact my grandfather's life of service, his call. My father's education journey brought him to my grandfather's alma mater, the medical school, in the late 1960s. He was drawn to rheumatology, inspired by a dear cousin who had suffered from rheumatic disease during an era where most diseases were yet to be fully delineated, let alone successfully treated. He was an academic rheumatologist whose clinical practice spanned from urban and suburban Chicago areas to rural outreach clinics. His passion was clinical and pharmaceutical research and teaching in all capacities. I have many vivid memories from my childhood that revolve around his career, grounding with him to hospitals on the weekends, the doctor's lounges where I could always find the best treats, <laughs> sometimes being pulled into the patient room with him to meet someone who's been hearing all about me and my brother for years, <laughs> and many vacations centered around conferences where he was an invited speaker. As a child, I was given a glimpse of the sacrifices that occurred in this event, but I was also aware of the gratitude his patients, nurses, and trainees had for his compassion, kind, enthusiasm for learning and teaching. It is unclear to me exactly when I decided to follow in these giant footsteps. I suppose, like many who entered the generational family business, there was a part of me who didn't really tell or think twice. There were moments of guidance from both men on these two kind of things to consider. There was not one ounce of pressure. If anything, there were conversations about medicine changing. During the course of their careers, the science of medicine advanced immensely, and the practice of medicine changed significantly. I didn't fully understand their warnings at the time. Once I had become steadfast in my desire to be a physician, it was clear to me that my motivation was to help others. How I would accomplish this was less of it. I too followed my family footsteps to the same medical school in the late 1990s, where I quickly became involved in student government as class president. This opened doors to a path toward organized medicine through the American Osteopathic Association, or the AOA. I attended annual student lobby days in DC each year. Increasing roles in student leadership ultimately led to being a voting student member of the AOA Osteo delegates. Exposure to organized medicine and healthcare policy so early in my career was an absolute blessing. One I had not intentionally sought out or more or less stumbled upon. Having a voice on the floor during policy deliberation and involvement on committees was truly eye-opening. I learned that our oath to protect our patients did not start and stop on the bedside. This was not a lesson taught to my classmates. It was not in our curriculum. My classmates and I did not have the widespread use of the internet to gain use, uh, to gain information let alone algorithm-based social media <laughs> to bring social and economic policies and constructs to our attention with little effort. Organized medicine introduced me to other student and physician leaders whose professional successes and challenges helped shape
shaped my views on the changes needed in healthcare. In hindsight, my love of pediatrics and critical care medicine seemed like it was pretty eternal. But pediatrics was not even on my radar entering clinical rotations. It was, however, my first rotation. And it quickly became the standard to which I subconsciously compared every other field. Having had the fortune of my first impression of pediatrics being at a high acuity community children's hospital opened my eyes to the complexities of care for our most vulnerable population. I later returned there for residency. The place where I fell in love with the care of children and found my calling was only two miles from my high school. There were stretches in my training where I lived at home with my parents. The dinner time discussions with dad during those years were on a new level. I had rotated in this hospital throughout medical school, the same hospital where I rounded within many years before. The wards, the clinics, the doctor's lounge, a new meaning that still felt like home. One of my favorite experiences was a two-week elective on his service. Like many other adults, I took for granted that unique opportunity to fully witness my father in his element. These are now some of my most cherished professional and personal memories. Here's why. Around the time I decided to apply for Pediatric Critical Care Fellowship, my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Fourteen-month-long battle taught me countless lessons, personally and professionally. I was blessed to be training so close to home, allowing me the opportunity to my life. His sense of responsibility for his patients and his trainings was unwavering during that time. That same hospital where he dedicated his career and where I grew up is where his battle with cancer. His death at the beginning of my fellowship, along with the birth of both of my children during fellowship, solidified the coming year's focus to be on family and career. My graduation occurred down, during a downturn in the economy, causing the majority of the hospitals to which I initially applied to pause hiring. Pediatric critical care had been a field of significant growth throughout the country during my training, as more and more hospitals were open with pediatric ICUs, placing supply and demand in my favor. But this promise was not my experience. I had received my bachelor's from the University of Iowa and would gladly considered the opportunity to return here. Our family of four moved to Des Moines to join what is now known as Mercy One Children's Hospital Pediatric Intensive Care Unit staff. Coming from two large extended families, moving hundreds of miles away from all things familiar with very young children was not a small feat. We quickly fell in love with all the charms of life in Iowa. Almost 14 years later, we are immensely grateful for the happenstances that led us here to the community that has helped us raise two truly awesome teenagers. As the strain of the early years of parenthood and my career subsided, opportunities to become more engaged within my hospital and IMS surfaced. It has been my experience, the opportunities that I have said yes to, opportunities that were not necessarily on my radar, have been some of the most fulfilling. My subspecialty, historically, unsurprisingly, was one of the highest burnout rates. To borrow from Cheryl Sandberg, leaning in and broadening my horizons past the number of patients on my census is paid off many times over for me. The timing of IMS leadership in my life was nothing short of amazing. Reigniting my interest in advocacy and organized medicine. The fellowship and knowledge I have gained from my fellow board members, I cannot possibly find enough adjectives to describe. I want to thank each and every one of you, those of whom I have served with, your perspectives and impact will forever remain. I joined the board roughly a year before the pandemic was declared. The impacts of the pandemic on healthcare are ones that we will be feeling for a long time. Iowa has been no stranger to the discussion of workforce issues and access to care long before COVID-19 became a household word. However, the pandemic has taken our workforce issues to a new level. The economic impacts we are facing are unprecedented. Although the pandemic was officially declared over recently, those of us in healthcare will be tending to our wounds for years now. And I believe the wounds in Iowa would be deeper still as one of the lowest reimbursed states in the country. With reimbursement rates essentially unchanged for the last decade, in stark contrast to inflation and supply chain, supply chain mixed with cost of contract labor to staff our practices, the number of problems to be solved are piling up. Meanwhile, we are still 
desperately trying to find the best care for our patients and communities. Do more with less. We have seen closures of hospitals and birthing centers in rural areas that arguably need more, not less help. In fact, there are few hospitals in our state that are not financially struggling to make ends meet. This is not sustainable. The closures of hospital-based services for children over the last two years impacted families around the country. Many of my efforts during the pandemic were focused on pediatric access to care in our state. Search planning changed over time from our perspective. Thankfully, children were not the burden on our healthcare systems. Pediatric wards and ICUs were frequently utilized to, for adult care during a long need. As the economic weight became heavier, many places around the U.S. chose to permanently convert pediatric wards and ICUs to adult services due to low patient volumes and significant disparity in reimbursement for children and their health care. Over 25% of the PICUs in the country closed months before respiratory illness surge in last fall. They've been incredibly proud to have worked alongside the fellow Iowa Children's Hospital leaders on a daily basis over the last two plus years in an attempt to improve access for Iowa's children's children. All three of our hospitals receive children from our surrounding states where they have run out of picky beds due to closures. Our collaboration was grassroots and unprecedented, but born out of necessity. Although there is still much work to be done for our state improve the ease of access to higher level of care centers for patients of all ages. The groundwork has been laid and that alone is progress. It is only human during times of stress to become focused on self-preservation. And those who are in the midst of their training years during the pandemic were forced to do just that. If you don't have the pleasure to work with our phenomenal medical students, presidents, and fellows who are training in Iowa, or you haven't had a new grad join your practice in the last few years, you may not likely have reflected on how this has impacted them. Practicing physicians or colleagues, I challenge each of you to consider how different your knowledge and experiences would have been in your given fields if your clinical training was limited in the ways our current trainings experience. At minimum, the learning curve would have been steeper. Perhaps your choice of field would have been completely different. Please remember this as these fine trainees recovered from their extreme challenges. Their experiences are like none before. To our next generation of physicians, I want, you to, I want to commend each of you for taking on medicine as a career, as I know just how difficult the journey was for me. Mentorship is a hallmark of our profession, and I hope we, as already practicing physicians, rise to the unique challenges to meet more needs. The challenges faced over these last three years and over the coming years in many ways have amplified the problems that already existed in our healthcare systems. We must not overlook or forget some of the extreme things we encountered. Perhaps you closed your practice and paid employees to remain at home, all while trying to figure out how to pay the rent for your space. Perhaps you were the critical access physician who held up the morale of your emergency room, all attempting to care for patients much higher acuity than what you were designing. Or you were the hospitalist, intensivist, or infectious disease specialist at a tertiary quaternary center who is trained to always take the patient and be of help, <coughs> but you cannot, as you're drowning your way with dying patients in a volume you never imagined. The moral injuries we have sustained cannot be ignored, and yet we are here, persevering for our patients when our own reserves are low. For me, self-preservation during this time caused me to question my purpose. Like, um, was I thinking what I needed to medicine? I was at a personal low point when I was invited to Harvard College of Medicine's convocation ceremony last year on behalf of IMS to be one of the few physicians on the stage. Almost exactly 25 years prior, I had been performing on the stage at the old Pantor Auditorium with a dance major. Sitting on the stage of the reborn Pantor, I found myself reflecting back on that young lady and her journey. Would she make this different choices if she knew what I know now? That all changed the moment they began calling individual students' names to be put in. I was one of the first people to see the glimmer in the eyes and the overwhelming sense of accomplishment and hope on the faces of each student as they heard their names preceded by the word doctor for the first time. The why for which I did this, the why I'm still doing this, became much more clear. The words of the oath taken had renewed meaning on that day. It was almost exactly 20 years from the day I took it. There is hope <coughs> that the trials and tribulations we are facing will all be behind us one day. Medicine and healthcare changed a lot over the last few years. As a Greek philosopher once said, change is the only constant. Over the lifespan of the three generations of doctors in my family, science and art of medicine, 
delivery of medicine, oversight of medicine, and cost of care have changed immensely. Changes in workforce and demands of the evolving populations are not a new problem. The scope of practice changes for DOs was born out of necessity during wartime, when MDs were sent overseas. I stand here now, I feel it's especially important to remember that it took physician advocacy to achieve that. Our discussions of workforce shortages and potential solutions, including scope of practice today, are different. But these discussions need our voices to ensure that any changes made are executed well with a focus on patient care in the center. It is not the strongest of the species that survive, or the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. Charles Darwin said that, and I believe it to be true. As I move into this new role, I want to assure you that IMS has and will continue to respond to changes needed to improve patient care, the practice of medicine, and uphold the sanctity of the patient-physician relationship. We are an ever-evolving profession, and it is imperative for us each to lean in speak up when possible for the sake of our patients. Medicine is deeply personal to each of us. I hope that you find reflecting on and sharing your personal stories with colleagues, <coughs> legislators, and others will help renew for you why you took this leap and put in, put in all the grueling years of work to do what we do. I thank you all for your time and your willingness to listen. I look forward to meeting as many of you as possible, as I possibly can in the coming year, as we try our best to learn how IMS can help you achieve what you need to serve your patients and communities. IMS would not be the organization it is today without our staff. Steve, Bill, Katie, Sarah, Heather, 